Now, I'm joined by another Husker legend here on 93.7 The Ticket. Check out everything The Ticket at theticketfm.com. This man was a third-round draft pick by the Pittsburgh Steelers, a first-team All-American, second-team All-American, first-team All-Big 8. Did we lose him? All right, Brendan doesn't want to talk to me. No, I think we got disconnected. So Jake's going to hit him back up. And while we're working to get Brendan back on the line, Brandon Stye, if you didn't know, okay, will be joining us here shortly. Some surprises in college football. And the first one I'm going to talk about makes me mad. And I, I, I'm not a Florida State guy. Of the three, I still don't pay attention to UCF and USF and Florida Atlantic and Florida International, no disrespect. But of the three major schools there, Florida State was my favorite, but they're like 1,000th on my list of the 133 favorite schools in the country. Did we get them back? All right, Jake's going to reach out to Brennan. They got rid of the, the tomahawk, chop, uh, tomahawk Chop chant on third down. And even I think that's asinine. Is he back on the line? We're going to talk about how asinine getting rid of the Tomahawk Chop chant is down at Florida State on third down. After we talk with the Husker legend, Mr. Brendan Stye. How you doing, my friend? Adam, how are you? Dude, I'm good. I appreciate you joining me. All right, so I got like 4 million questions. I'll round it down to three, and I'll only <laughs> keep you here for five hours if that's cool. All right? That's, uh, that's reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat reasonable. All right, first question right out the gate. Dude, you're there every day. Practices, mm-hmm. the players, the coaches. Okay, what, whatever level you're comfortable going in depth on this, you go. Um, but what is different? From now to a couple of years ago, to a rule taken over last year, it appears to just be getting better and improving at a noticeable pace. What is different, in your opinion, from your vantage point? Well, I think probably number one would be uh, the accountability across the board, um, you know, from coaches to players. It seems over the last year and a half, uh, going on two years, that uh, the accountability is at a high level, and when I say that, you know, people sit back and go, "Well, how do you how do you compare that?" Well, so I look at all the experiences I had in that space, as far as um, on the collegiate level, uh, professional level, um, you know, the business and the space that I'm in now. Um, everybody has a role. Uh, the responsibility of that person um, has to be inclusive of the team. And the accountability level but has to be at the highest. And, you know, I, when I left here, um, I really felt like it was at the very highest level back in 1994 under Coach Osborne. And with that being said, you know, you know, you, you ask about, like, what's underneath accountability? Well, it's, it's the professionalism in which you approach your job. And I think uh, Matt Rule and his staff and these players have really taken that to the next level. And, and you're seeing it. Um, and it, the accountability uh, starts with the little things. But those little things, Adam, as you know, um, those matter in the long run. And the more you can build on those little things, the more success you're going to have both on and off the field. And, you know, there's a lot of things that we do here at Nebraska Athletics uh, that are at a very high level, number one being academics. Um, you know, and winning is, is pretty much everything these days. And we win, we win comprehensively with all sports. Um, you know, unfortunately for football over the last uh, decade or so, uh, the winning hasn't been there. And so why is that? Well, you can point the arrow at a lot of different things, but I think it boils down to the amount of accountability and the professionalism that you approach your job every single day that has mattered. So you're, you're absolutely right with everything you say, starting with, I, I'm a detail-oriented guy. If I decide something doesn't matter, I'm the most dig- disorganized person in the world. But if I decide something actually matters to me, I am the most organized, detail-oriented person you'll meet. And I don't mind driving other people nuts with it, but what I'll say to them is little things add up to big things really quick, really quickly. So you make a phenomenal point. I'm going to share a story from last spring real quick. I was allowed to sit on, on the D-line meetings, and one of the younger guys was kind of screwing around. One of the older guys in the room turned around to him and said, shut the F up and pay attention. I almost gave him a standing ovation, except I didn't want to interrupt the meeting. But, <laughs> dude, is that the type of accountability that you're talking about? Oh, yeah, and, and it's on every level. You know, I mean, if it's in the classroom, if it's on the field, if it's outside of – um, you know, what they're doing here, 
at the university with the athletic program, and this is for all sports, but football in particular, uh, there's an amount of, I think, self-policing that these, these young men have to have, and it starts with leadership. Uh, leadership is, it comes in all shapes and form. Um, you know, some guys lead by example, some guys lead uh, with their words, and, and some guys do both. And, and unless you have the guys that lead with both that are going to hold each other accountable, uh, then things kind of get swept under the rug. And when that happens, those those small little things, they just keep accruing into a losing atmosphere in culture. And then all of a sudden, things aren't going well. People start to point fingers, and it's easy to do that. So holding each other accountable at the highest level it, it, with everything they do is, is, is really important. And where that comes from, um, I don't care if you're a sophomore. You know, um, as long as you're doing and saying all the right things, um, you're allowed to voice your opinion. Um, now, certainly you have to earn that respect, but it should come from the older guys. The, the leadership level should come from the older guys because they, they've gotten their teeth kicked in. They've, they've gone through everything that it takes, uh, and they've done all the little things to get to that point to actually have a voice. I think you're 100% right. I've always said coaches are the directors. They tell you and point to you where you should go, but the veterans on the team should be the leaders. And to your point, it can be a young guy. When a guy like Dylan Riola goes and runs gassers with the defense when the rest of the offense isn't necessarily required to do so in camp, that's leadership, despite your age, even despite your position. So I think you make a phenomenal point there. I've got to ask, because we had heard about accountability, and we've heard the C word, culture, for so long to a point where people don't even want to hear it anymore. And when I dropped the C word, I could almost feel people rolling their eyes through the radio as I talk to them or on TV as they're watching me. Why, after we've heard about this for so long, what is different now? Why is it actually different now? Well, you, 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 you talked about it. It's leadership. I think it starts with Matt Rule. Um, coming into this situation, obviously, his background, his resume, and doing what he did at Temple and in Baylor, and then going through the ringer of the NFL uh, instantly, I think, gives him the credibility. But it's one thing to have credibility. And it's, it's another thing to actually follow through on it. So he came in here and he set the tone at the very highest level and he's not wavered one day. And not only obviously with his players, but with his coaches, with the fans, with administration, uh, with donors, he has never wavered. Um, and I think when you have that kind of leadership and go back to coach Osmore, um, you never had a guy that was too high, never too low. He was always the same guy, and you could count on that. And Matt Rule, to his level of intensity, has never wavered from that. And I think it starts with with Coach Rule. All right, man, to your point, like, there's people with credentials. Those same people don't always have credentials and respect. And I think that's something mm -hmm. that Matt Rule's been able to garner so far early on in his tenure here at the University of Nebraska. So that's a phenomenal point. All right, man, you got Northern Iowa this weekend, then Illinois coming in, and then Purdue, and then Rutgers, and then Indiana, and then Ohio State, and everyone's talking 7-0, and game of the year, game day versus Ohio State. We got five games to play, starting with one this weekend versus the team that is used to playing FBS opponents and used to playing Power 5 teams, Iowa and Michigan, on the road in their house. So how do the Huskers, after a well-deserved, momentum-building, highly emotional win versus Colorado in an electric atmosphere last Saturday, Memorial Stadium, how do they keep that focus just as sharp as they get ready to play Northern Iowa and then Illinois uh, in, in under a week, on a short week, on a Friday night? Well, you know, it, you, you talked about it, 1-0. Uh, and then Coach Rule, his philosophy uh, every week, uh, you're approaching this as we want to go 1-0. and Respecting your opponent, uh, certainly. And I think uh, in today's game, there's much more parity. Um, so every team has the ability to go anywhere, really, and match up um, if you've got your guard down. So that 1-0 and mentality, I think, really is where you start. And um, you certainly have to take a look, a hard look, at what you're doing wrong. Uh, certainly, you want to affirm uh, the, the highlights uh, of games. Um, but as you know, as a former player, you're only as good as, you, you know, you think you are until you watch that film and, um, you know, things are glaring. Um, you know, you can have games where you feel like you played terrible and you actually played pretty good. So having the ability to go back, 
uh, correct the mistakes, um, approaching this game um, with uh, the utmost respect for you and I. Um, you know, I mean, they're a great running football team. We've got a lot to prove when it comes to stopping the run yet. So um, there's a lot of goals that are set out in front of us right now, but I think having that mentality of 1-0, um, dealing with the team coming in here and trying to be, you know, the, the upset team of the year, if you will, and not having a letdown is huge. All right, man, we're going to go back to your playing days. Let's talk about going into that 95 Orange Bowl, the 94 championship season. You're getting ready to play the Hurricanes. All right, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, he wasn't known as that then, but he was on the team. Ray Lewis, Warren Sapp, and you're asked to actually go from right guard to left guard going into that Orange Bowl, the original pipeline, greatest old, one of the greatest old lines, if not the greatest in the history of Nebraska football. When you were asked to go from right to left guard, to go head-to-head -head with Warren Sapp, what were your thoughts? What was your reaction? What was that process like getting ready for that Orange Bowl, switching sides? Well, I'd only been in Coach Osborne's office twice, to be honest with you. Um, after my second semester here, I went from a 3.6 down to a 2.8. So we had a discussion about uh, you know where I was spending most of my time. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then fast forward um, – Going into that, uh, you know, that first week of preparation for our bowl game, um, so we sat down and we talked about uh, the Oklahoma game and really uh, a couple different things um, that he was talking about. One, uh, the the outcome of that game, you know, certainly we won. Uh, we went against a really good defense in Oklahoma. Uh, the right side of the line graded much higher than the left side. And there was a, a sense and a philosophy that if we could, uh, you know, balance that out a little bit uh, to to bring those percentages up was one philosophy. And then the other philosophy was, you know, this was probably the most um, talented, if not uh, fastest defense uh, that we had seen that year, and certainly I had ever seen. <laughs> you know, when we mm -hmm. started playing them, it was it was true, but. Um, it was it was hard for me initially because I knew it would create a little bit of unsettling um, in our room in particular because you're so used to as as an as an offensive line playing next to each other having nonverbal communication things um, change when somebody moves a position uh, certainly guys get hurt and guys plug in so you know the consistency of play really comes from you know, piling up those games and those snaps next to each other. So I was a little concerned with that. Um, certainly how Joel would feel moving over to the right guard to play next to Zach and, and how Rob would feel having me move over to the left and play next to him. Uh, so there's a little concern there. But, you know, again, uh, you hear it all the time. I'm a team player. I think most of the guys on the team understood uh, that you know, we would do anything it took uh, to to win, put ourselves in a position to win. And and then after talking with him a little bit about that, we talked about some of the plays that uh, we were thinking about and designing uh, really to take their, it, it, their speed and use it against them, in particular with Warren Sapp. And so if you watch that game, uh, throughout that game, um, you know, he was insanely quick. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the guy, he just, uh, he's probably one of the better free techniques in college football history. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few of them that came out of Miami. Cortez Kennedy, you know, there's, there's quite a few guys. But, you know, it was taking their speed and using it against them. And so that short trap play uh, we designed um, in particular uh, to utilize. And, and Coach Osborne actually talked about it last Friday night at our 30-year reunion. Um, but really, essentially, you know, not even blocking the guy, letting him, you know, just fly off the football, come up the field, and then next thing you know, Corey's scoring a touchdown on a quick inside trap. So there was a lot that went into it. Um, if you've ever played offensive line and had to switch sides, it's not an easy thing. You go from left side of brain to right side of brain, vice versa. So there was an adjustment for me, um, you know, in particular, uh, kind of bouncing the plays from the left to the right of my head, left, right to left, as well as, you know, your technique, you know, when you're, you're, your stance, you're really supposed to stagger uh, based on the side that you're on. So if you're right guard, you stagger your right foot. You're left guard, you stagger your left. And I told Milt I would do that. I just didn't want to switch my hands. So here I am in a left-handed, left guard stance, right, with my right hand down. If you hmm. watch that game, I didn't put my left hand down. So there was little little things that I kept um, 
you know, and then again, you, you have to get used to the, the footwork, right? So yep. Aaron Graham stepping on my feet the whole entire team during the orange ball, just, I mean, it's because I'm underneath him and he's not used to it. Uh, but there was a lot that uh, went into uh, getting ready for that game, a lot of preparation. I think we scrimmaged a couple, three times just to verify and and really be crystal clear on what was fair going in and who started as far as Brooke and Tommy. And I thought Coach did a good job with that. Yeah, when I interviewed Coach Osborne three weeks ago now, I asked him if he had a most memorable game. And obviously there's a lot of options for him to choose from. He actually chose that 95 Orange Bowl versus Miami, I think getting that first national championship as a head coach, obviously, is unique and special to him for obvious reasons. All right, last question, and I love asking guys this question who played in 94 or 95 and or both. And it really started with Rob Zadica about, I don't know, six, seven years ago, said this randomly on his Doc Talk uh, podcast. Shout out to Doc and Travis. Go check out Doc Talk podcast. They do a great job. But he believes, to this day, that 94 Nebraska would have beaten 95 Nebraska. Now, I'm fully well aware this is a loaded question, which is why I think it's fun, and I have no dog in the fight. But (laughs) who would have won? 94 Nebraska? Because his argument is 95 Nebraska was all of 94 Nebraska's backups. Who do you think would have won? 94, if we could play this game out, or 95 Huskers? Well, who's who's that starting quarterback, 94, 95? (laughs) Oh, that's a good question. I haven't Uh, thought about that. Yeah. Right. But, you know, to be honest with you, um, I, th- I think that there there's probably, um, you know, advantages on both sides. Now, if you were looking at the offensive line, there's a reason why we were the starters, mm-hmm. right? In, in 95, I think a lot of people uh, felt like there'd be a drop-off there. Uh, but starting with Aaron Graham, I think, uh, you know, he took uh, those guys and said, hey, listen, you know, we can be as good, if not better. And if you look at the numbers on the ground, they were better than us. Um, now across the board, talent-wise, defensively, I thought uh, we were we were getting to that level of dominance on defense. I felt like the '95 team um, had kind of uh, grown one more year uh, with some of those younger guys like uh, the Grant Wistrons of the world, the, the Jason Peters of the world. Um, you know, of course, Christian was still there. Um, linebacker-wise, they had grown. Um, of course, we lost Ed, but a core of those guys had remained on defense. So I thought defensively, you know, from the skill position, from the defensive back all the way up front, that front seven, maybe they had the advantage of uh, with us from that 94 team. But across the board, there was a lot of parity. You know, it would be it'd be a close game. All right, man. That's a great non-answer answer, but I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Of course, no. you know, with the 94 team squeaking one out. There you go. Now we, now we had a little bit of fun. <laughs>